This is Perspective on EVN. Today, my guest is Professor John Ishiyama, who is University Distinguished Research Professor and current chair of the Department of Political Science at the University of North Texas. He was president of the American Political Science Association, EPSA, from 2021 to 22. From 2012 to 16, he was editor in chief of the American Political Science Review. His research interests include uh, democratization and political parties in post conflict uh, politics, with a focus on Russia, uh, Eurasian, and Ethiopian politics, ethnic politics, and the scholarship of teaching and learning. He has published extensively, producing 10 books and over 200 uh, journal articles and book chapters. He has received numerous awards and major grants, including the EPSA Frank J. Uh, Goodnow Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Association's Political Science Education Section, and the EPSA Distinguished Teaching Award, the Quincy Wright Distinguished Scholar Award by the International Studies Association, and the EPSA Hens Elwa Award for Best Article Published in the Association's Journal. Welcome, Professor. All right, thank you. Welcome. Thank you very much for having me. Great. Uh, it appears that uh, you have studied uh, Ethiopian politics uh, for uh, a long time, uh, especially with emphasis on the consequences of ethno-nationalism. As you know, we know uh, the constitution itself is based on ethnicity. It uh, embraces uh, ethnic politics, which is the main uh, form of organizing in Ethiopia, uh, politically speaking. So to begin with, uh, why are you interested in Ethiopia's ethnic politics? Uh, well, uh, actually, it's reminiscent of how I started my career. Uh, I started my career studying uh, post-communist politics with a particular focus on post-Soviet politics. Uh, as, you re as you may know, the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia also adopted a model of ethnically-based federalism that was inspired by Marxist-Leninist theory. Uh, to a large extent, Ethiopia's ethnic federalism is very similar to the kind or, and ideologically justified in a very similar way as the system that was used in the Soviet Union and in Yugoslavia. So uh, that actually piqued my interest in Africa because Africa as a result of, you know, uh, the changes after the rule of the Dur is in some ways a post-communist society as well. So that's how I became interested because I have a long-standing interest in the politics of ethnicity in a post-communist setting, particularly the legacy of ethnic federalism in other places besides Ethiopia. The post-Derg era in Ethiopian politics is characterized by uh, ethnic, uh, the ethnicization of uh, the whole political system. Yes. Uh, and uh, the internationalization of ethnicity through ethnic federalism. Mm -hmm. Right. So, how do you assess uh, how the ethnic federalism in Ethiopia has impacted the nation at large? Uh, yeah, I think uh, we have to sort of do the current debate on the impact of ethno federalism on politics because, you know, originally, as you know, uh, Melis and the uh, TPLF justified the uh, institution of ethnic federalism in part arguing that uh, not only to give voice to various groups, but it was the only way to keep the country together. That was one of the arguments is that creating an ethno-federalist arrangement would keep the country intact. Um, I know that was a justification and certainly there are defenders of ethno-federal arrangement that make a similar argument, but I think that in the case of Ethiopia, the adoption of ethnic federalism has accelerated inter-ethnic conflict especially in the 21st century, the legacy of that system. Uh, ethnic federalism, I think, uh, although it may have been a, uh, a, uh, a uh, convenient uh, and timely adoption in the 90s to keep the country together, has had some long-standing consequences 
on the ethnification of identity and increases in inter-ethnic conflict. And I think that is a product of ethnofederal. Despite the fact that uh, the TPLF tried to justify why they impressed uh, ethnic uh, federalism, mm -hmm. uh, many argue that it was actually an insidious effort, you know, to divide and rule the country and impose a minority regime led by the TPLF. Uh, yes. You know, how do you see or how do you evaluate, uh, you know, both justifications? You know, that, I've heard that argument from many of my Ethiopian colleagues, particularly uh, those Amhara colleagues, who said that that is one of the reasons why the TP, TPLF adopted it. You know, I think that was probably a reason, but I don't think it was a primary reason. I think really the primary reason was that, you know, first, uh, it was, I think, their notion of a, uh, once they took power, this is their ideology. You know, the TPLF had argued that, you know, they, they fought on the behalf of Tigrayans and that the only kind of a united Ethiopia would have to recognize ethnicity. So that was, it was, there was an ideological reason. I also think that, you know, there was a practical reason in that sense that they thought that it would keep the country together, uh, especially after the rise of uh, increasing what is the nation of ethnicity. But I, I do think there was also the third reason that you mentioned, that by doing so, uh, they could create a single uh, one-party state ruled by a largely Tigrayan political elite, uh, and the EPRDF would be that one one party that would govern the country and hold the various ethnic regions together. In many ways, it was an ethno-federalism that was held together by a one-party regime, much like the Soviet Union was held together by the Communist Party. Um, in this case, though, I think that clearly the TPLF was the core of the EPRDF, so one could make the argument that this was a rather cynical a uh, kind of cynical attempt to uh, impose the, the rule of a, a minority that represented about 6% of the population. Uh, however, as uh, you, you very well know, wherever there is ethnic politics, there is polarization and yes. uh, conflict and instability. So do you think that uh, embracing ethnic politics in a very diverse uh, country like uh, Ethiopia was uh, a wise idea, especially you know, given the destabilization, the ethnic conflict, the uh, harm it caused on the nation. Uh, yeah. Because at this time, uh, you know, the political system is highly polarized that every, every ethnic group almost has a liberation front, uh, even if it's not clear who is liberating who from what. Yeah, right. The, this is where the politics of identity has triumphed over everything else. Um, you know, to be to be fair, uh, some uh, advocates of ethnic federalism have pointed to some countries that have adopted something similar that have kept the country together. Uh, but most of these are in Europe or developed countries. Like they'll point to Belgium or Canada, right? Uh, which, by the way, are fairly wealthy countries and already democratic. Uh, they might point to India as well. Uh, as uh, ethnic federalism has helped keep that country together. But these are very different than Ethiopia because they are all developed democracies. When Ethiopia adopted this uh, form of ethnic federalism, like uh, the Soviet Union did in Yugoslavia, they were not democracies. In fact, they were it was originally instituted as an authoritarian regime. And uh, essentially, identity became the preeminent organizational feature of the system. Once uh, you had the opening, the thaw under, I, I suppose you could say it was Abiy Ahmed, that this opening and the uh, sort of opening of the EPRDF and its transformation in the Prosperity Party opened this Pandora's box, just like the dissolution of the Communist Party opened up the Pandora's box in, box in the Soviet Union. So it's not always the case that ethnicity or even federalism leads to the decline of the state. But I think that there are clearly examples where that has happened. They largely are previously authoritarian regimes that began to democratize Allah, Yugoslavia, and the Soviet Union. I think Ethiopia is much more like them than they are Belgium, Canada, or India. The irony is that uh, when the TPLF uh, decided to adopt uh, ethnic federalism, the Soviet Union and the former uh, Yugoslavia 
uh, you know, had already disintegrated. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I really wonder why they preferred uh, ethnocentric or ethnic federalism, especially given the fact that uh, these uh, models, uh, right. the two models, the Soviet Union and the, the Yugoslav models, uh, already disintegrated. Yeah. You know, I actually think that part of it is the ideological orientation of the TPLF. You have to remember that, you know, the uh, elite, the leadership, including Mellis, were educated in places like Albania. So they were quite familiar yes. with Marxist Leninist theory and their approaches to federalism. I think one of the arguments that uh, the TPLF leadership made when their observations of the decline of Yugoslavia, the disintegration of the Soviet Union, is that it wasn't due to ethnic federalism, it was due to something else. It was due to the corruption of society. It was due that they were not, they in fact were not ethnic enough, that they had not gone far enough to decentralize power. And as a result, uh, both the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia disintegrated. So I think part of it's ideological. There was a true belief that ethnic federalism was the way to hold the country together, even though there were plenty of examples that its adoption had led to the dissolution of the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. So I, I think that's part of it. I think the other might be that it was a convenient, it was a convenient organizational form by which the, the TPLF could control the state. Uh, so you mentioned that earlier that, you know, this was sort of a cynical way in which to justify the dominance of the political system by a small TPLF core, the EPRDF. Um, but yeah, I think that's why they did it. It was both ideological and practical. In one of your studies, uh, you focused on uh, the ethnic consciousness, especially among yeah. young people. And uh, what were your findings? Uh, well, you know, we had some recent uh, research articles uh, that dealt with this question about is, is, uh, is there a growing ethnification of identity in Ethiopia? And uh, what, it, we, what we demonstrate is that generally, yes, but has proceeded along, uh, accelerated among certain groups more than others. So, for example, uh, as we point out in uh, some of the work that we've done, ethnicity has always been an important part of Ethiopia. I mean, it has. It's just been, it's, it's been dealt with in different ways under the imperial regime, under the Derg, but it, ethnicity was always an important element of Ethiopia. However, there was always the sort of overarching ideology of Ethiopia with that, or Ethiopianness that held the country together. That despite the ethnic and linguistic diversity, there was something, a common national identity that was Ethiopianness. Um, I think that, you know, uh, for the Oromo and for the Tigrayans, there was less a sense of Ethiopianness, well, or I should take that back. The Tigray believed that when they were in charge, but I think that there was less of a sense of Ethiopianness or Ethiopian with that, and that, that clearly shows in the data. Um, what's, what I think is most interesting is that uh, for many years, if you looked at some survey data about the Amhara, Amhara tended to uh, embrace the idea of Ethiopianness that there was some identity that bound the country together. Uh, and that was from data from 2013. We re-examined some data in 2021 and found that there was a dramatic decline among the Amhara about Ethiopianness, and that uh, there was a growing sense that the Amhara were uh, an ethnically uh, unique group. Uh, this was particularly pronounced among young males, Amhara, that really drove this ethnification of identity so what has happened is that there are there's much and much less mass support, uh, especially among young people, uh, for this idea of Ethiopianness. Uh, we have uh, currently competing ethno-nationalist movements in Ethiopia. Does that uh, indicate a danger for the future, or is it just the beginning uh, for a compromise? Um, I don't, I, I will tell you, I, I'm a little more pessimistic than some of my colleagues who think that, you know, this will just uh, it create a greater dialogue between the group. I, I, I think that uh, because I was in the Soviet Union in 1990, uh, this looks very similar, this kind of ethnic outfitting, that ethnic identity is more important than anything else, uh, and that everything is, is seen through the lens of ethnicity. I. 
And in such conditions, especially when you're emerging from a conflict, there's much less room for compromise, much less room for the uh, promotion of inter-ethnic tolerance. I think that when you have uh, you know, political movements based on ethnicity, their incentive is not to compromise with other groups, but to outbid each other so that they look like they're the true representative of the Oromo or the Tigrayans or the Amhana. So I, I must say I'm a little more pessimistic about things. Are there any developing countries who have succeeded in uh, establishing a stable form of uh, governance, you know, by employing ethnic federalism or ethnocentric, uh, you know, uh, political organizations? Well, you know, I mean, there have been some examples, but they're, they're mixed results. I mean, for example, Malaysia has uh, not an ethnic form of federalism, but sort of ethnic representation by the three uh, largest groups, either the, uh, the Hindi the, or the Indians and the Chinese and the Malays. Uh, except that works because uh, the United National Malay Organization, the governing party, is dominated by the Malaysians, but they have subsections of uh, Indians and Chinese in the governing party. Uh, that, that, that seems to work, uh, although it is held together by one dominant governing party. Uh, Lebanon was held out as an example of something that worked before it devolved into civil war. Uh, I mean, the examples that I see that the advocates of ethnic federalism argue for often point to developed countries like Canada or Belgium as examples of success or models that could be followed. But I, I just don't see that. I, I don't see very many uh, uh, developing countries that have followed this kind of ethnic federalism uh, solution and it has worked. More often than not, it has not. You have also written about uh, Ethiopia's transition, uh, yeah. new transition under uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. You know, everybody, not just Ethiopians, even people around the world would hope that uh, Abiy was a different kind of leader who can bring about a more uh, liberal, democratized, united Ethiopia. Right. Uh, but, uh, you know, it seems to have failed. Mm -hmm. w what went wrong, you know, in your assessment uh, as a political scientist? Well, I mean, part of the, uh, I mean, there was a great deal of optimism when Abiy Ahmed became a prime minister in 2018. It looked like something different than the, you know, uh, previous prime minister, Ali Mariam Desalegh. Uh, but, you know, it was all based on the assumption that somehow Avi Ahmed was different than other EPRDF leaders. I mean, he was, after all, uh, socialized and politicized in the context of the EPRDF. Uh, he was part of the single party system that held the country together. So, you know, I mean, there was hope because he had done many things like, uh, you know, uh, Remove the terrorist edict uh, against many organizations, and they legalized many of them. They became political parties. He normalized relations with Eritrea. You know, so there was a great deal of hope that there would be a new wave of liberalization. But to some extent, you know, the kinds of reforms uh, that were undertaken in 2019 reflected, I think, what he had in mind for the country. You know, when he created the Prosperity Party. So that if you look at the Prosperity Party, he moved away from ethnic, uh, ethnic parts of the EPRDF to a more unitary party. Uh, to me, what I think is that he thought of, uh, he thought the difficulty with ethnic federalism, but tried to roll it back to, re to reduce the amount of uh, ethnic identity. Not, not in terms of the constitution, but sort of de-ethnifying the EPRDF. And as you know, by trying, by shutting down uh, the autonomous ethnic parties that had made up the, the PRDF, this rather uh, alienated the TPLF, and that that created the troubles that ultimately led to the civil war. But you know, I you know, I, I don't know if Abi was ever a Democrat, <laughs> or if he ever was intent on engaging in fundamental political reform. All the actions, I think, is sort of he's restoring the one party state, where the prosperity party becomes that one party. But rather than being based upon ethnicity is based upon a unitary party that's based on an ideology. You know, and that ideology, I think, is what he introduced also in 2019, which was that the Medemer uh, ideology, you know, synergy ideology. 
and uh, based upon this idea that you know uh, there is Ethiopian desert. The other thing I think we should remember is that um, although in 2018 and 19 did become so apparent, but uh, Prime Minister Abiy is a Pentecostal Christian, and yes. the idea of prosperity is a fundamental part of Christian nationalism or Pentecostal ideology, and that's been part become part of the ideology of the state. So it's no longer Marxist-Leninism, it's based upon sort of this idea of prosperity, which is derived from the fact that I think he's a Pentecost. On the surface, yes, uh, the prosperity party seems to be unitary, but in reality, if you scratch the, the surface, you will find a Roman prosperity party, a Mara prosperity party. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so right. You know, it's, it's actually uh, divided along ethnic lines. Uh, despite exactly. the fact that right. he tried to disguise it as as if uh, it uh, was uh, you know a unitary party with one identity but it has multiple identities within it i think that's uh, a degree of practicality though because you know you can't eliminate uh, the legacy of these individual autonomous parties but i think the idea uh, that he has although it hasn't come to fruition yet is to cre create a party that has a single non-ethnic identity now that might take years, but I, I think that's part of his plan. You know, one thing that uh, emerged um, throughout, uh, you know, the 90s, even now, mm -hmm. is the fact that the Amharas became a target of uh, most ethno-nationalist movements because they were seen as the enemy, the dominant yeah. group, uh, even if that's not the case. Yeah. Because in Ethiopian history, there were dominant ruling elites a ruling class, but not, uh, you know, the ethnic uh, group in terms of uh, dominance has been asserted. So uh, now the Amharas are fighting back, you know, they are resisting yeah. through armed struggle. What's your take on that? Well, I, I think that, you know, this sort of idea of the uh, Amhara as the oppressor narrative uh, does go back quite a long way. I've, I've been uh, working with some Ethiopian scholars who pointed out that actually this was first uh, introduced uh, by uh, the Italians in their attempt to sort of undermine the authority of the imperial state uh, to appeal to uh, non, uh, especially Tigrayan and to some extent Oromo uh, feudal elites that, you know, their oppression was the oppression of the Amhara over them. So, and that, that was taken up later by uh, sort of in the 1980s and the 1970s and 80s by some Marxist-Leninist groups that talked about, you know, the oppression of the Amhara and the Amhara state against the oppressed minorities. And that, that kind of narrative has continued on uh, even now. I mean, uh, I think uh, the Oromo Liberation Front, I think there are other, uh, the TPLF to some extent addressed this as well as that, you know, the, the, the struggle was not just against the imperial state, but the struggle was against the imperial, uh, the, the colonizer the Amhara, and hence, you know, the idea that the Amhara were the oppressors took root in, in the TPLF, and I think in the OLF and other groups as well. And that, that's sort of been carrying over. Now, I think one of the effects of all this is that, uh, you know, it, it, it has caused the Amhara and people and the elite to believe that, you know, they're being victimized, they're being attacked. Uh, this kind of rise in uh, Ahada ethnic identity is kind of a defensive ethno-nationalism that, uh, that since they're being targeted, uh, they begin to rally around not ethiopian this, but Ahada national identity. I think, I think that's what's happening now. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, the Amharas, most Amharas identified uh, themselves as Ethiopians. Yeah, for some, uh, from before, yeah. Yes, yes. But now, because of the growing ethno-nationalism even among the Amharas, yeah. uh, this uh, nationalistic feeling is declining. So where does this lead us? Uh, there seems to be no center that can hold Ethiopians together because uh, nationalist sentiment is being uh, attacked or diminished, you know, because of uh, in highly amplified ethnic uh, identity yeah i i'm not real optimistic i know that uh when uh, abi prime minister abi introduced his synergy medimer uh, philosophy in 2019 it was sort of based on this idea that 
or the assumption that somehow uh, Ethiopia as a state could be rebuilt based upon Ethiopianness. Uh, I think that was wishful thinking then. I, I don't know what the I don't know what it is now. Uh, because it seems like he's targeting the very groups that used to be support, most supportive of Ethiopianness, the Ankara. Um, so, I, 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 you know, you asked me where are we going to go from now. Um, it, it, it doesn't look very promising, I think, uh, the future. You mentioned, you mentioned that uh, when the Italians came to conquer Ethiopia, mm -hmm. they introduced uh, the false uh, narrative that uh, the Amharas were oppressors, the yes. enemies of sure. the oppressed. Uh, not only did they uh, introduce uh, this uh, false narrative, they also divided Ethiopia along ethnic lines for yes. the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, can we trace back uh, the current ethnic uh, federalism to what the Italians introduced uh, during that time? Uh, I guess perhaps so. I mean, I don't think there's a, I have yet to see any work that directly connects, you know, the TPLF ideologies uh, with the, you know, Italian uh, notions of, uh, you know, Amhada as oppressors. I, I do think that the TPLF found that to be a convenient foil to mobilize people against the imperial and then later on the Derg state. But, uh, you know, that's sort of an interesting uh, argument. I have yet to see any, like, direct connection between the Italian intellectuals who came up with this and the, uh, you know, TPLF elites who ended up implementing it. Uh, but, yeah, there is... I think it's just because uh, the Italians use the divide, uh, divide and conquer and rule tactic, and I think that to some extent the TPLF did the same thing. So if there's similarities, it's because they took advantage of what they saw were opportunities. During the, the reform, the TPLF felt that uh, it was pushed out, you know, yeah, yeah, from the yeah. center. Yeah. They went back to Mekale, uh, yeah. the capital city of Tigray, and uh, started conspiring against the federal government. Yeah. And that started a horrific conflict, which has devastated e Ethiopia for the worst. Uh, yeah. Even the economic cost has been huge, like $28 billion of loss for Ethiopia. And over 1 million days and uh, wounded, uh, millions were dislocated from uh, uh, their villages. So uh, now we have uh, the Pretoria Peace Agreement still uh you know this ethno nationalism and uh, the ethnic federalism is still in place so do you see any emerging uh condition for these highly fragmented ethno nationalistic movements to come together and uh, settle for a united country which doesn't seem to be the case now yeah um, I mean, there are some conditions that, yeah. You know, for example, like uh, uh, one case that comes to mind is Bosnia, which was racked by civil war. But one has to remember the reason why Bosnia stayed together and the war ended is because all the sides became exhausted. And then NATO, which has never left, uh, keeps the peace in Bosnia. I don't see it. I don't see that happening where a third party intervener would you know, effectively uh, be involved in keeping the peace in Ethiopia. Um, you know, I think right now, um, well, I, I mean, there are some sort of promising signs in what it's like, you know, in Tigray, uh, for example, the Bretion was removed and replaced by his deputy, the uh, who, who served with, uh, Abi Ahmed in the previous cabinet and apparently has a better relationship with Abi than, than his predecessor. So. I, I suppose that that's a positive thing. At least the uh, government in Michele and the government in, in Addis are talking to each other. Now, having said that, I mean, that might be considered a positive to know. There are a lot of negative ones, too. For example, as you know, the unresolved st status of Wakaya uh, and Mera, you know, that, that, or what they collectively call the West, Western Tigray. Uh, that that has not been settled. That has that remains a major sticking point, I think, uh, in terms of normalizing relations between uh, the clients and the state. Also, I think though that uh, while that's going on, the sort of sort of tentative peace between uh, Tigray and, and the state, 
this has activated a greater conflict within the Amahada region, whereas Amahada elites believe that what's happening is that there's a con conspiracy, uh, conspiratorial settlement between uh, Mekele and Addis, leaving the Amhara out. And hence when uh, the Ethiopian National Defense Force tried to reintegrate the Amhara militia, the phone, into uh, the regular military in April, this started, this ignited effectively a civil war in the Amhara region. So yeah, I, I think that this becomes very complicated, very difficult in the coming years. Perhaps what might happen is that Everyone gets sick of fighting, and then we are ready to have a right point for some kind of settlement, more permanent settlement. But I, I don't see that. Uh, as you know, uh, ethnic uh, politics has fragmented so many countries. In fact, most African countries try to suppress uh, identity politics for various reasons especially because of the fact that uh, it leads to fragmentation and destabilization. Yeah. But Ethiopia has fully embraced ethnic politics and probably paying the price of, you know, uh, yeah. allowing ethnic uh, politics to flourish, uh, yeah. ethno-nationalism to flourish in Ethiopia. So uh, where does this kind of situation or political arrangement lead to, especially when you allow ethno-nationalism to, to flourish? Yeah, you know, um, there are some projected solutions that exist in the literature, but I have to say that, um, you know, one of those alternatives is you can't really turn the clock back. So before ethno-federalism, that, that bell has already been rung and cannot be unrung. So the question is, given the circumstances now, what can be done to build peace, stability, and democracy in a unified Ethiopia? Now, I, one of the uh, potential solutions, although it has its problems as well, is not ethno-federalism, but a form of what we call consociationalism. Uh, consociationalism is the idea that there's a coalition of ethnic elites who essentially divide up the state, and each of the groups are represented uh, in a way that they can veto the actions of the other. So this idea is that giving essentially sections of the state uh, to different ethnic elites, and then they come to some accommodation in terms of sharing the spoils. Uh, that 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 might be that might work. Although that that there's a lot of debate over whether consociational solutions, where you have this coming together of different ethnic elites to divide up the state and come to some kind of accommodation while keeping the country together, uh, at least formally, uh, is the best way to go. But uh, that is one potential solution. It's kind of an, kind of a, uh, I think, extreme solution. But right now, I, I'm not sure if there are any others on the horizon. One of the challenges of uh, allowing uh, ethno-nationalism to flourish is the fact that these uh, ethno-nationalistic movements compete for power and wealth uh, yeah. resources. So uh, you know, because of uh, this, they tend to go into war and conflict uh, permanently. Mm -hmm. So, because of this, is it not possible for countries suffering uh, under, you know, this kind of political arrangements to ban ethno-nationalism and introduce a proper kind of party system? Um, well, I think you could try. I don't think that'll work. Uh, Has it been tried why, anywhere? Uh, actually, there have been ethnic party bans in several countries in Africa, but they've never gotten to this point where there is a full-scale conflict. Uh, there have been ethnic party bans in many countries in the post-communist world. But what ends up happening is that uh, uh, these ethnic parties, they just form under a different name. And they, they claim that they're not ethnic. So most of these uh, ethnic bans don't really work in terms of effectively banning ethnic parties. Uh, what else it does is that by banning ethnic parties, they become even more radical. Uh, and, and, and because they become sort of martyrs, uh, they become... You know, underground movements, they become even more radical. So there's less likelihood of accommodation as a result of ethnic party bans. I have a colleague, a uh, German colleague, Matthias Basadal, wrote extensively about this about a decade ago, and demonstrated that ethnic party bans actually don't work. How about uh, the, the case of uh, Rwanda? They, they banned ethnic uh, political parties. Yes. 
identity, you know, pronounced uh, identity has been banned legally. Yeah. And Kenya has also done the same. Uh, what about those cases? Well, and Kenya actually is kind of strange because even though they banned it, you can clearly see ethnicity is still one of the primary political cleavages in Kenya. They just don't call themselves ethnic parties. Uh, and uh, Rwanda is not a democracy. I mean, you could institute an authoritarian regime, a fairly extreme authoritarian regime, that effectively bans ethnicity as an organizing principle. I would also say Rwanda is a, is a, a rather unique case because I think after the genocide, everyone in Rwanda became so sick of ethnicity that they were willing to accept an alternative. And Kagame offered that. Uh, I don't think we're at that point in Ethiopia yet, where all the sides are exhausted and are willing to abandon the idea of ethnicity. Uh, Kenya, I don't think is really, their ban is completely ineffective. I think the election uh, are still organized around competing ethnic groups. Although they have not, they've not disintegrated though. In the, in the case of Ethiopia, they're trying uh, to build a kind of uh, national consensus. You know, they established mm -hmm. a commission uh, which uh, is supposed to facilitate dialogue among uh, conflicting parties and even among uh, the populace. Would that uh, spark any hope for Ethiopia? It, it might. It's a beginning. I, I think the way you get people of different identity groups to work together to think that they can all benefit, that there's more to benefit from being united than being divided. Uh, I think that is one thing that still keeps people together is that it's hard for me to believe that Tigray can actually survive as an independent state. Uh, I, in fact, I, I find it hard to believe that many ethnic groups in, in, in Ethiopia could survive on their own. So there's always that sense that we're better off somehow, materially, economically, uh, and in other ways together. Um, so, you know, I suppose these kinds of commissions could work, especially if some of the great powers decide to say that if you do these things, then we will infuse Ethiopia with large amounts of investment and aid. Uh, I, I think that the Chinese would be interested in that because the Chinese have invested heavily in Ethiopia and a disintegrated Ethiopia is not good for Chinese economic investments. Uh, the United States have provided and the West has provided Ethiopia with a lot of aid and also uh, uh, Ethiopia is an important security partner for the West. Uh, I think they would be also interested in keeping the country together and, and could provide incentives uh, for uh, leaders of the various groups to abide by unified Ethiopia. So many people blame uh, the United States as well, you know, in uh, promoting ethnic politics in, in Ethiopia, because uh, when the TPLF took over, they were the one who fully supported, you know, the political arrangement as well as a special bond and partnership with uh, the, the TPLF. And people felt that uh, the Americans uh, made Ethiopia a guinea pig of, uh, you know, this ethnic politics, which has, of course, failed, you know, uh, from uh, a practical point of view, it has never worked. It's uh, caused so much conflict and uh, destruction. Uh, so many people died as a result of uh, this conflict, this never ending conflict. Uh, so many people has, have been displaced. Ethiopia was once uh, uh, the top country uh, for people for idps mm -hmm. uh, you know you also pointed out in your research that ethnic politics was directly correlated to all uh, the conflicts you know most conflicts mm -hmm. in, in in ethiopia so where can be or where can ethiopia find the way out and uh, how do you see uh, the role of the the us you know in terms of uh, promoting ethnicity in ethiopia yeah, you know what I think. I don't know if the United States was complicit in designing the ethnic federalism. I think they did buy the idea that the TPLF was selling that this was the only way to keep the country together. I think the United States' interest, as it has been throughout the world, is not really to dictate the, the domestic political settlement, but to promote stability. Uh, especially, uh, you know, as you might recall, about the same time. The United States had uh, it had a, a, a very disastrous foray into Somalia. There was a growing sense that uh, Ethiopia was potentially the only stable country in the Horn of Africa, uh, and the Horn of Africa is strategically important. So I think the United States 
saw any way to stabilize Ethiopia, even under the leadership of the TPLF and their, you know, plan to ethnify the country as being a better alternative than Ethiopia falling apart. So in, in, in the sense of being complicit, I think the United States was complicit. They looked the other way because they really didn't realize the longer term consequences of ethno-federalism because they were very much interested in the shorter term uh, goal of stabilizing the region. I still think that is the U.S.'s primary goal. Uh, uh, now that we see what has happened as a result of the choices that were made in the 1990s, uh, the goal is still to maintain stability in Ethiopia. I mean, you know, what makes this particularly dangerous is that, you know, if you look at the Horn of Africa, there are not very many stable partners. I mean, Kenya has its problem too, but uh, Somalia, uh, South Sudan, uh, Sudan now, uh, and Eritrea is often referred to still as the North Korea of Africa. So it's not, there aren't a lot of viable alternatives in the Horn, which is by the Red Sea and close to the Suez Canal. So I think the United States would like to see a stable Ethiopia. That's why I think the, their role is to promote a stable Ethiopia, but I'm not sure they have an idea of how to do that. But I don't think uh, anyone uh, does. Yeah, it was evident that uh, the U.S. embraced, uh, embraced the hegemonic uh, rule of uh, the TPLF. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. They, they, well, they, they've also supported, uh, uh, you know, the RPF in Rwanda, because which is also a one-party state, because, you know, they back the one-party states because they're stable, not because they're democratic. Can the United States uh, play a positive role in stirring Ethiopia out of ethnic politics? Yeah, I, I don't know. Like I said, the bell has been rung, so it's, it's difficult to de-ethnify politics in Ethiopia, uh, short of like a huge, tremendous genocide like they had in Rwanda, and I hope, certainly hope that does not happen, because that would be so much worse for the world. Um, I, I do think that it, it both the great powers, the European Union, uh, the United States, and China all have an interest in stabilizing Ethiopia. I think that uh, the Pretoria Accords are a beginning. Uh, I think these, the, the National Roundtable is a beginning, but I think you need resources invested into Ethiopia to provide material incentives for the various parties to, co to cooperate, to maintain the ceasefire, and to come up with some more permanent settlement. But this is going to be difficult because while you're normalizing relations between the Tigray and, and the government, you're antagonizing the Amhara. So, uh, yeah, I, I'm not, this is a needle that'll be difficult to thread. But I think uh, it would probably be the great powers together in concert that would uh, provide incentives for the various groups to realize they can benefit more from remaining together than being apart. How about uh, amending the, the constitution? Uh, the constitution is the foundation of uh, right. this ethnic politics in, in Ethiopia. Yeah. Would uh, it help if uh, the government or this competing ethno-nationalistic uh, movement is agree to amend the constitution at least to create an atmosphere where ethnic politics will have less devastating impact? Yeah, I think I mean, that would be a solution but I don't think it's going to happen, largely because there are now institutionalized interests in all the regions that seek to enshrine this principle of ethnicity. I mean, you know, uh, you know, Sidamo, for example, or uh, Elita Naromo, or Romia, or uh, elsewhere, they, there's, they have inherent interest in maintaining ethnic federalism, like, you know, the creation of the, 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 the 10th and 11th states in Ethiopia were based upon, you know, we need to follow the ethnic principle of the constitution. So I, you know, I remember Adi Ahmed sort of uh, introducing sort of the idea of de-ethnifying the political system, but then retreated after being a, a sort of uh, pushed back by Oromo elites that, you know, the answer is not to de-ethnify the country. The answer is to we can make it more ethnic. So I, I mean, there's so many institutionalized interests supporting this kind of ethno-federalism. I, I don't think it'll have, I, I think, I agree that it would be good if that were done, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh -huh. You know, given the fact that identity politics uh, 
is ravaging uh, countries around uh, the world. Uh, where does this lead to? Uh, is it going to destabilize more countries uh, for the worst, or is there uh, a better trend uh, in terms of minimizing the uh, cost and devastation of uh, identity politics? Even identity politics in the U.S. is becoming a problem. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, partially it's because uh, um, identity politics uh, become important when people feel insecure. You know, that uh, they feel threatened either uh, economically, culturally, or physically. And then they begin to rally around their particular tribe or group. That certainly happens in the United States. It happens elsewhere. It happens in Europe. Uh, the key, though, is to prevent it from uh, becoming the majority opinion. You know, in other words, you're always going to have, uh, frankly, you're always going to have identity groups. Or, and you're always going to have radicals. And radicals uh, can demonstrate, but as long as they are not the majority of those who are politically relevant, uh, then you can contain that. You know, identity politics has historically come way ebbs and flows. Uh, right now, I think that even like in the United States, the idea of uh, identity politics has taken root, but it's not the majority because I think people realize that there are benefits to maintaining democracy for all of us. Uh, I think in Ethiopia, there has to be some realization that uh, we all benefit more from staying together than being apart. That has not, message has not come across. Uh -huh. Are there uh, cases where, uh, you know, countries that have embraced ethnic politics also were able to build uh, a democratic uh, nation? Yeah, uh, I mean, well, certainly they're the older democracies like Canada. Especially in developing countries, of course. Or uh, developing countries. The developing that, countries have the institutions in place already, you know. Right, the right. Institution, is uh, very important to, to build a democratic system, as you know. Yeah, I think, you know, um, where they have been ethnic divisions, and much of Africa is ethnically divided, there are some uh, success cases, if you will. I mean, I think that uh, probably the two examples of a successful, quote, and these are relatively successful cases. And they're the ones I can think of, I, I've been to Ghana, for example. Uh, now, Ghana has been able to do this because they've developed fairly stable party system that is they have two parties that really do represent different ethno-political groupings but they're not entirely based upon ethnicity and that there has been a uh, sort of alteration of power so that everyone gets their uh, their turn to eat at the table uh, that has maintained uh, some degree of stability in ghana i, I think another example is 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 uh, is, is nigeria uh, you know, Nigeria was also racked by extreme inter-ethnic conflict that led to the Biafran War in the 1960s. Uh, but what has happened over time, and, and perhaps this is a product of years of military rule, is that most of the civilian elites became united, whether they were Yoruba or Hausa or, or Igbo, against the military. So that provided some kind of common front, common basis by which they could act. And, you know, the military uh, remained actually in power when the generals simply took off their uniforms and became presidents, like Opatanio and all the others. Uh, but they, they sort of took turns over who would be president, and that would represent the Hausa or the Yoruba or the, or the Igbo or the Muslims and the Christians. And they seem to have found some kind of accommodation. Now, in part, I think it's because Nigeria has grown economically that they've become not only one of the economic but political centers of Western Africa, and, and certainly the cultural center. And I think that has helped them maintain this unity. But I think part of it is that all the ethnic groups got their share of power. I think that happened in Ghana, too. Now, the other example, which I think is fairly successful, which is really not where the, all the ethnic groups have gotten their share of power is South Africa. Now, I was just in South Africa a couple of weeks ago, you know, South Africa is quite prosperous. Now, there are underlying interracial and interethnic tensions, but those seem to have been uh, sort of masked by a democratic political system, but where one party wins all the time, which is the ANC. In many ways, uh, it was a young democracy in that rights are protected, that uh, people get to vote, there are regular elections, but one party always wins. Uh, that's very similar to what happened in Japan after the Second World War, uh, and still is the case today, it happened in India. Uh, so maybe one solution is 
having rather like a democratic dominant one party system like they have in South Africa, or having this kind of alteration of power, sort of kind of consociational system that they have in uh, Nigeria and Ghana. I think those are examples that might. Now, this is all, this is, I mean, it's all tentative because, you know, Nigeria could explode tomorrow. No, right? South Africa, <laughs> you know, uh, there's always an underlying tension between, you know, the racial and ethnic divisions there. And Ghana, too, uh, who knows what will happen now that they've discovered oil, whether now that the stakes are higher, they'll begin more conflict between the various groups. But I think if you're going to point to Africa, those are the those are three examples that are probably fairly successful. In some of your studies, you used uh, a tool called uh, Afrobarometer. To yes, that's right. Yeah. To measure ethnic uh, versus national identity. That's right. Uh, what is Afrobarometer and how is it used to, to measure the two? Oh, Afrobarometer is actually a survey across uh, 36 African countries. Uh, it's been going on in eight waves since about 2000. Uh, for people who do empirical work on attitudes, uh, it's, it's really the go-to survey instrument uh, that people use. Uh, it is akin to the World Value Survey which is a global survey of political attitudes. Um, uh, it's based upon a random selection of about 1,200 uh, mm -hmm. individuals per country, including Ethiopia. Two of the waves have included Ethiopian respondents. Uh, and there was one question on the Afrobarometer that uh, most researchers who talk about ethnic versus national identity use, uh, and, and it asked people that if they were forced to choose between their ethnic and national identities, what would they prefer? Do they think of themselves as more Ethiopian than they do Oromo, or do they think of themselves as more Oromo than Ethiopian? And so that has been a way to measure how uh, the growing uh, growth of ethnic identity. And so what you know we did for uh, Ethiopia was looking at the data from 2013, uh, and then also people identify what ethnic group they belong to, and then comparing it with the data from 2021. And clearly, respondents in 2021 thought of themselves as being more ethnic than Ethiopian, and also among the Amhara. So, what were the results of uh, this uh, Afrobarometer for, for Ethiopia? Does it show a trend uh, of increase, increasing ethnic identity or uh, absolutely yeah. national ident absolutely. ethnic identity? Absolutely. I mean, it's to it's clearly ethnic identity. The trend from 2020 or 2013 to 2021 is greater ethnic identity among all groups, now, and especially among young people. Now, there is a, sort of a generational difference among the Amhara. Older Amhara uh, tend to be uh, still cling to this idea of Ethiopianness. Uh, younger Amhara, meaning those uh, under 30 or so, are, are rapidly becoming, are thinking of themselves as Amhara only. So what is, what is this indicative of for uh, the future of the country? Uh, more conflict or uh, yeah. more troubles? I think, well, it's clearly what's happening is there's the ethnification of identity. It is becoming much more pronounced among young people. Uh, it's becoming more pronounced, especially among young males. And I think what is exacerbating that in Amhara is that you know, Amhara is one of, the, one of the poorest regions in all of Africa with less infrastructure, with more poverty, uh, and fewer economic opportunities. So I, I think that when you have a lot of unemployed young men, they are very susceptible to radicalization based upon ethnic identity. Uh, I, I, I think that this is a real challenge facing the country in the future. Uh, that's why I think we, you know, it would be nice to abolish ethnic federalism, but I, I don't see that happening because there's too many institutionalized interests who want to keep it around. But there might be some other uh, solution, like uh, a alteration of power among the ethnic elites in the form of consociationalism. Or perhaps maybe Abiy Ahmed has something in mind, like what the ANC does in South Africa, having a dominant one-party system where you have occasional elections, but the dominant one party always wins. Uh, I think that those are potential uh, approaches to uh, what we're seeing in Ethiopia. But I think that Ethiopia has sort of spun out of control in some way. So now there is also uh, essentially the institution of martial law, 
uh, or the institutions yes. of an extreme dictatorship, which would be sort of rather like what the RPF did in Rwanda. Um, that is a solution, or that is an approach too. It's a non-democratic one, but it would it would have to be a very radical uh, approach to de-ethnify the country. You mentioned that uh, the Amara region is one of uh, the most impoverished uh, regions in in the world, but this, this same group has been demonized as uh, the oppressor and exploiter of uh, other ethnic groups. So you can see the irony and the contradictions in all that. And now, uh, Abi has launched a military offensive to disarm Amhara uh, militia like Fanno and yeah. the Amhara Special uh, Forces, despite the fact that they had threats from uh, the Tigrians. Uh, yeah. uh, even if there was an agreement, the Praetorian agreement, according to the Praetorian agreement, they were supposed to Disarm, but they are still claiming that uh, they have kept 270,000 uh, militants, uh, yeah. which, which is almost intact. So, because of these uh, threats, the Amaras wanted to stay armed, you know, to to protect themselves from uh, what happened previously during the the, the, the Tigray war. Yeah. So, where does this lead to in your uh, in your view? When you have an armed identity group that offers alternatives to the, uh, the national army, that's never good. <laughs> that that, yes. that that never good. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, the the tragedy is that uh, almost all regions are armed. Yes, yes, yes. Several yes. militiamen in Tigray, in Oromia, in Afar, everywhere. But yeah. the, the Amaras feel that they were targeted by Abiy Ahmed, even if they they gave him massive support when he came to power. Yeah, and they need, I think, you know, I, I think it, because it's rather like who's going to disarm first, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it would be nice if, you know, in many ways, uh, and I, I sometimes draw uh, sort of uh, analogies to uh, what Thomas Hobbes called the state of nature, which I think is the civil war. And that is, uh, how do you maintain or get people to accept peace in the state of nature when everyone's armed to the teeth? Who's going to disarm first? Because the first one to disarm will be the first victim. Yeah, this is this is the, this is the challenge I think facing Ethiopia. Uh, the uh, Fano is not going to disarm as long as they think that everyone else is armed to the teeth. Then they disarm, they will become victimized. Abi Ahmed's assurances have ring very hollow uh, when they think that the Tigray and TPLF has remained armed and the uh, Fano militia need to disarm. So I'm not sure the government is handling this well. But in order for the country to avoid a civil war, we cannot have competing militias anywhere. So we'll have to see. Given the fact that Ethiopia is in turmoil and uh, is also one of the most highly ethnicized countries in the world because of yeah. its full embrace of ethno-nationalism and ethnic federalism, yeah. uh, what is the way out from all this mess and turmoil, in your opinion, and uh, as a political scientist who studied Ethiopia for uh, quite a while? Yeah, I, you know, if you asked me this about five, six years ago, I would have I would have been far more optimistic than I am now. Now, the question is, is there a way out? Well, there are always a way Why are you not optimistic? Yeah, I'm, I'm not that up. I mean, there are always a way out. It could come become so terrible that you have a, uh, a genocidal warfare that, that far out, 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 out classes what happened in Rwanda, and people become so horrified they stop fighting. But, you know... I can't imagine that happening in a country where there's almost 120 million people. So well, that would be a terrible outcome. Um, I, I think that you know there is always the possibility of the imposition of martial law and the reinstitution of a one-party dictatorship. Uh, but that that takes a lot of resources because you have to suppress a lot of armed groups will be immediately opposed to that. Um, I. I in my view, this is not the easy way to do it, but I think you're going to have to come up with some agreement where each of the groups feel they have a stake and a say in the system, that all national policy will be subject to the agreement of all groups and each group can veto it. It's sort of like the Swiss confederation system. 
you know, Switzerland has a system where all power is in the hands of the locals, uh, but the, any national policies have to be agreed upon by all of them. But in uh, Ethiopia, we have a hostile ethno nationalistic movement. How can they agree even to for to to form that kind of arrangement? I, they got to be paid off. <laughs> I think <laughs> this is what I've been saying is that uh, when people make these calculations, sometimes it's based on emotion. But if they believe that they can be made better off by agreeing to stay together, uh, they'll that'll activate sort of more pragmatic elements in each of these groups. Because you know, frankly, my opinion about politicians. Even if they represent identity groups, they do want power and influence. And if they can get that uh, through not fighting or through for, without a civil war, then they'll do it. Civil wars are bad for most people. Uh, political scientists try to quantitatively predict uh, the future of uh, you know political process yeah. based on current realities and. Uh, various factors yeah if you uh, would be or you you have a, a chance to do that uh, in the case of ethiopia what would be and you have studied the country for a long time what would be your prediction for this country in turmoil yeah uh, political scientists are like meteorologists predicting the weather <laughs> it's not absolute they're never absolute yes of course of course yeah but you can say in terms of probabilities right yes uh, if, if we thought of Ethiopia staying together or disintegrating, I, I would actually say it's closer to 50-50. <laughs> it, right now, I'm not optimistic. That's a big probability. It's a big, it is a big problem. What I see is kind of this, un, this unraveling happening. And, I mean, it, it, of course, you know, Abi might decide to stage a sort of government coup and then Seize all power and declare martial law. That's always a possibility. But you know, right now, it, it, it looks pretty dangerous to me. I mean, what's happening in the Al-Hada region right now, uh, the sort of confrontation between the local militias and local elites and the central government, uh, the, the, the difficulties uh, over, you know, the Walkayet and Humana region, uh, where, you know, I don't see an easy solution to that. I, I also read the other day that... Uh, the uh, Fano militia and the uh, OLA, the Oromo Liberation Army, have been fighting with each other. So, you know, these are, this, it, it feels like it's getting out of control. I hate to be, I hate to be pessimistic, but I, I just am not beginning to feel that optimistic. Uh, yeah, I agree with you, you know, the whole political situation is complicated, you know, it yeah. can lead to disintegration. Yeah. Like uh, uh, what happened in, in Yugoslavia, uh, yeah. because we have, we have already got these uh, ethnic uh, states, uh, which yeah. are highly antagonistic towards e each other. Yeah. Uh, given all the circumstances, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, what kind of leadership do you think is necessary to hold Ethiopia together, uh, you know, well, yeah. the failure of leadership is so pronounced uh, these days. Yeah, you know, I, I, I actually, I had thought that when Abiy became uh, prime minister, you need somebody that all the groups, or at least the big groups, not necessarily all, but the bigger groups, trust. And I thought Abiy sort of had that. Not necessarily with the Tigrayans, but, you know, because of his background with his parentage, that he's a mixed Oromo and Amhara background, Muslim and Christian background, that maybe he was the person that uh, the various groups, particularly the Amhara and the Oromo, could trust. But he seems to have squandered that. Yeah. So my, my hope has sort of disappeared that he is the person. Now, if you ask me, are there any, is there anybody else? Um, who, who could uh, unify the country. Most of the leaders I see uh, who are out there are not really uh, promoting Ethiopianness or a unified identity. They're promoting their own particular ethnic ones. You know, the most public people like Jawar Mohammed in Oromia or, you know, uh, the Bretion in, in Tigray. I mean, I don't see that leader coming to the forefront and, you know, saying that, 
this is Ethiopia. Um, I mean, there maybe there is somebody lurking in the sidelines. Uh, and, you know, I, I think, you know, total hope. I mean, you know, uh, some one glimmer is, you know, Getacho is now, uh, was made leader of the Tigrayan government, and he seems to be more reasonable than the Brazilian, but, um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I don't see, I used to think, like, yeah, you know, Lema in, in Oremia, although he's kind of falling out with, uh, you know, uh, Abiy Ahmed, uh, could have been that person, but I don't know. I think you need somebody who all the groups can trust or believe they can trust and work with. Because I, I, I think Abby has lost that trust. Yeah, one thing you mentioned uh, is the fact that Abi Ahmed uh, squandered a very unique opportunity uh, yeah. to bring the nation together and, in fact, assert a genuine reform. Right. What went wrong, in your uh, opinion? Uh, how did he manage, I mean, how did uh, he uh, lost the opportunity to transform the, for the better? Where did it go wrong? Uh, you know, boy, I think it was just a, a series. I, I can't say there was one single event. I do, I do think that his attempt to create the prosperity party uh, and de-ethnify the party, although you're right, it still had its ethnic branches, uh, and, and doing so without getting the, the buy-in from the TPLF, that, that marked a major mistake. Because uh, then the TPLF used that as a pretext to, you know, hold the elections and elect a government that was not recognized by the uh, regime in Addis, and that sort of sparked the entire civil war. I thought, also, I, I guess when, you know, they had the, the uh, decriminalization of Number of ethnic, you know, or a number of uh, resistance groups, like you know, behind the Negus group, and all these, that uh, that they should have been brought into the government, right? So that it would look like a national unity government that former opponents uh, who were not ethnically based uh, could be incorporated into the, the government, and then that would signal that we're all in this together. But you know, that wasn't done either. Um, so I, I think there were a number of small mistakes. And I think the big one was, uh, you know, uh, going forward with, you know, the prosperity party, with going forward uh, in ways that seemed to antagonize the TPLF. And that's what every, that's when the TPLF, you know, effectively seceded and then uh, the TPLF security attacked an army base in Tigray. That's when it really all unraveled. Now, if there was a turning point, it was that. Before we sign off, let me give you the last word, if okay. you have any. I love Ethiopia. <laughs> I, mean, I always have. Uh, it's, it's like uh, one of my favorite places to go to. I, I, I regret that I'm not able to go uh, recently. The places I used to go to were like in Bahadar. Uh, and I have many colleagues at Bahadar University, but that is an area where there has been fighting. And no longer... It's, uh, my, my government here in the United States has cautioned any travel to the Amhara region. That, that makes me very sad. Uh, and I have been saddened by uh, the events over the past few years. I, I, I am not optimistic about the future. I, I mean, I've, other people have sort of accuse me of being too pessimistic, but I do think we're getting to that point where something uh, extreme has to be done to save the country. And, and I'm not sure what that would be, but I think uh, it would you'd, ha you'd have to essentially provide incentives for the various groups to believe they are better together than the other. I'm not sure we're at that point. It calls for uh, a strong and wise leadership, uh, which is not in place. Uh, that's no, and, and I'm not sure I see anyone on the horizon <laughs> either. You know, that's, that's a problem. That, that's a problem. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Professor uh, Ishama. Uh, yeah. That's Thank all you. we have for today. <laughs>